So I want to thank, of course, everybody involved um, in um, the invitation to me, the Simpson Center, and you know, the, um, the um, Solomon Katz Foundation. So, um, and apparently people organize with the weather because I understand it rains all the time in Seattle, and you know, to my astonishment, it's a bright and sunny day. So you have the handout, which does not, of course, mean that you should rush to the exit, um, uh, the exit's barred, I hope so. <laughs> But it does mean that you ought to be able to sort of follow along very easily. So my, my title, uh, basically, as you can see, Liberalism and Racial Justice, I'm sort of engaging with the question of how political progressives should, should relate to, oh, I haven't turned this thing on. Uh, the, wow, what a difference that makes. <laughs> should relate to the, uh, the now hegemonic global political ideology. As you can doubtless tell, paper has been given before because whether liberalism still is a global hegemonic political ideology, maybe you know, um, you know, there are a lot of people raising questions about that. So there's a, a bit of dating here, but even if it's not, even if it's under challenge, um, part of the case I'm going to make is we definitely need to affirm it because you know, the competitors that are coming up, these are not you know, um, ideologies that we want to be sort of ruling over us. So anyway, so my thesis is that we should try to retrieve liberalism. So it's not going to be one of those papers, liberalism and racial justice, what a laugh, it's hopeless. <laughs> so, so what it means is that I'm going to argue that we need to recognize how illiberal, how non-liberal liberalism has historically been and sort of develop a different kind of history of liberalism than the sanitized ones that we tell our students, including many of you guys here. So this will be the truth about liberalism you may be hearing for the first time. And that, you know, on that basis, we need to sort of reconstruct it. So what it means then is that I have two sets of adversaries. You know, having one is bad enough. Um, so I've told Chip to make sure that I have a sort of road clear to the airport. He's going to sort of run interference from me if I'm ambushed by one of these sets of folks. So on the one hand, of course, I have traditional liberals who think, you know, what's this guy talking about? You know, liberalism is just fine as it is. There's a reason it's a global hegemonic, though until recent, on the challenge political ideology. Liberalism is just fine. If it's not broke, then, you know, don't worry about trying to fix it. And then on the other hand, I have a bunch of former friends. Uh, maybe that's a bit too harsh. <laughs> <laughs> so Marxists, multiculturalists, post-structuralists, I was thought is Jesus, Charles Mills, he was once this progressive guy, and now he's sold out so he can get invitations to places like this. He's a disgusting human being, and let's beat him up in the alley once he leaves. So as I say, Chip, who is, I think, more muscled than I am, um, I'm sort of calling on him to sort of you know, do the necessary dirty work while I rush cab for the airport. Okay, so... I'm going to start with a nice, respectable quote, because, of course, if you're doing this stuff, you need to make sure you don't beg the question to begin with with a very controversial position. So here's a very respectable guy, for those of you who know your political um, theory, British um, guy, John Gray. Okay, so John Gray is giving us a characterization of liberalism, and, of course, um, the language somewhat dated, but remember, um, I'm not responsible for it. Okay, common to all variants of the liberal tradition is a definite conception, distinctively modern character of man, and you can substitute person, man and society. It is individualist in that it asserts the moral primacy of the person against the claims of any social collectivity. It's egalitarian in as much as it confers on all men the same moral status and denies the relevance to legal or political order of difference in moral worth among human beings. It is universalist affirming the moral unity of the human species and according a secondary importance to specific historic associations and cultural forms, and it's meliorist in its affirmation of the corrigibility and improvability of all social institutions and political arrangements. It is this conception of man and society which gives liberalism a definite identity which transcends its vast internal variety and complexity. So I should explain very quickly for people not in political theory or philosophy that I'm using liberalism here in a broad sense. In the US, as you know, liberalism really means left liberalism. It means you know, Bernie Sanders, it means the left of the Democratic Party. I'm not using it in that sense. I'm using it in the sense of political theory and political philosophy where it's really talking about, as the Gray Court indicated, it's talking about the political philosophy of individualism, egalitarianism, the rule of law, all that good stuff, which emerges like in the 17th, 18th century and so. 
So you have a liberalism of the right, you have a liberalism of the left, but even people on the right, the people who in the US context you call conservatives, they're supposed to be sort of liberals by this metric, in the sense that they're, they're supposedly committed to the moral equality of all individuals, the sort of rule of law, and the idea that it's not the case that in any group should be regarded as sort of intrinsically positioned over any other. So in that respect, liberalism is a political philosophy of modernity, and it sort of arises in opposition to the old feudal order. Not, of course, in this country, but um, in Europe, the order of you know, social classes, social estates, and the idea that some people are naturally superior to others. So always remember, through everything that I'm going to sort of say, I'm using liberalism in this very broad, all-encompassing sense, which includes not just the left of the political spectrum in the US, but also the political right. Though it becomes complicated with certain kinds of conservatism where you know, you're committed to things which are not really liberal. So it's sort of liberalism in sort of conservative sense, sort of committed more to market solutions and government redistribution. But there is a sort of underlying you know, sort of sense that individualism is sort of important value that we need to sort of keep hold of. OK, so that's the sort of overarching concept, liberalism. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that you can get different varieties of liberalism by sort of working with different concepts of individualism, different claims about how egalitarianism should be, should be realized, more or less inclusive readings of universalism. Because I, I don't have to tell you, the gray coat sanitizes liberalism's actual racist and sexist history. So out of all of these, you can sort of work within a different balance of liberal values and sort of different senses of facts, and there's a huge potential for disagreement about all of these. So that rather than talking about liberalism in the singular, what I'm going to suggest is that we pluralize and think of liberalism as basically subsuming a variety of you know, different incarnations. And it depends whether you're sort of top-down or bottom-up person, Top down, you could think of it, okay, there's a genus of liberalism, and then you know, under that overarching genus, you have different species, different varieties of liberalism, all coming under that broad umbrella category. If you want to use the metaphor of a tree, you can have the sort of trunk of liberalism, and then it spreads into different branches. But in all cases, sort of crucial idea is that there's a common element which makes them liberal, but then there's a lot of variation. Okay. So if you're a political philosopher, if you're a political theorist, then you could have their traditional distinctions that people will know. There's John Locke's version of liberalism versus Immanuel Kant's. There's contractarian versus utilitarian liberalism. There's the one I just said, left-wing versus right-wing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are also some distinctions that are somewhat less familiar, which are going to be particularly important for us. For example, there's the actual historical liberalism versus the liberalism that's been sanitized and cleaned up, the kind of PR version of liberalism which basically covers up the dirty stuff and presents to students, here's the sort of the shiny and attractive ideology and doesn't go into all the funky stuff that's there in the actual historic version of liberal theory. There's ideal theory liberalism, liberalism of perfect society versus liberalism for imperfect societies. Um, feminist theorists will know the distinction between a liberalism that's patriarchal versus a liberalism that's feminist. Um, there's a well-known political theorist, University of Chicago, Jennifer Pitts, and she coined the phrase a liberalism that's imperial versus a liberalism that's you know, non-imperial. Um, my brief bid for philosophical immortality, you sort of constantly thinking of what phrase can I come up with that will survive me, that will appear on buttons, on bumper stickers, hmm, what? Uh, you know, never mind books, what's time to read books, you know, what's on TV, or these days, you know, date, dated cultural reference, you'll find I'm full of them, um, and no, no, nobody watches TV, they, they're on their laptops, so, you know, my, I have these dated cultural references, my students stare at me, how is this guy still teaching? Anyway, <laughs> okay, so dated cultural reference, so, you know, um, not, not um, you know, uh, TV, but anyway, so my bid is racial liberalism, so I'm going to sort of explain in greater detail what it means later on, but that's what I'm trying to sort of hope will survive me. Um, not as a reality, because I'm hoping it's going to be sort of you know, taken down, but as a sort of crucial concept. So I'm suggesting that you can sort of gather those under two big umbrellas. And one of them is the dominant varieties of liberalism, which tend to be conservative. And then on the other umbrella, you have liberalisms that are reconstructed, liberalisms that are more radical. And what I ultimately hope to persuade you 
um, those of you are sort of waiting to beat me up at the end of the talk, is that, lo and behold, you can do radical stuff within a liberal framework. So those people who now cross the street when they see me coming, Charles Mills, that disgusting guy was sold out, I say, no, I'm still doing radical stuff. It's just that I'm doing it in a liberal way. <laughs> we'll see how convincing this turns out to be. Okay, so let's take liberalism apart. What are its crucial components? Well, I suggest you know, the following five. There's a set of value commitments, and this is stuff that you know, if you're an American, you, know, you, you grew up on, that you know, everybody's supposed to be free and equal, and you know, the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all that good stuff, and it's committed to the self-realization of individuals. Then there's a certain social ontology. What is that, you ask? Well, if you're in philosophy, you have to sneak in the words ontology or metaphysics into talks because it represents of the APA sort of in a fan out across the country, and there's one in this audience at least, and they're waiting to sort of you know, yank your badge, your official membership, unless you have ontology or metaphysics in there. Okay. So who, I don't know who it is, but I've just sort of put it in there. So, so social ontology. So social ontology, you're supposed to sort of getting down to the basics, sort of essentials of things. So they're like the essentials of the universe. Is the universe made of matter? Is it just made of mind? So here we're talking about the ontology of a society. What are the basic existence? OK, then you want a conceptual cartography. What do I mean? A mapping of the sociopolitical. So for anybody in the room who's, who's sympathetic to feminist theory, you know that part of the crucial you know, challenge from, say, maybe first wave or certain from second wave feminist theory on is how do you think of the political system? And where does the family fit? Is the family part of it? Or is the family in a sort of special category of its own? It's ahistorical. It's natural. Questions of justice don't arise. So if you map the polity in that way, you're then going to be significantly disadvantaged as a woman trying to sort of make a case for gender justice insofar as so much gender injustice starts within the family itself. So the mapping of the political, that's going to be a sort of crucial part. And feminist liberals have basically argued that we need to sort of challenge the mainstream mappings of things, and we need to sort of recognize that the so-called private sphere has implications for the public sphere. So conceptual cartography, that's what I mean there. So a theory of history, so liberalism you know, doesn't have one theory, you know, different, theor different um, liberals have had different theories, but liberalism is often associated with a kind of Whig progressivism. Things are getting you know, brighter and better in every way. Well, you know that's you know, manifestly false. So you know, um, it's sort of you know, wiser to say, well, some liberals have believed that, but it's not any sort of necessary part of liberalism as such. And then finally, rights, protections, and freedoms. So rule of law, due process, freedom of association, freedom of worship, think of all that stuff you sort of take for granted as a citizen of a liberal state, and then ask yourself, what would happen if we change some of the others? Could it then mean that some of the rights on the category E could then be sort of changed and altered? So my suggestion is that apart from A, sort of basic you know, um, commitment to um, certain values, everything else is variable, and in fact, A is variable also once you take into account the fact that historically, not all populations have been able to sort of enjoy liberal rights and freedoms. And that then sort of give you a sense of how I'm suggesting that we can modify liberalism by sort of looking at those separate components and changing them and then considering what the implications would be under the category of E. Okay. Now, where do ideas come from? How do political philosophies develop? And so forth. So if you've ever done a philosophy class, you know it's heavy on dead white guys. Um, of, all, of all the disciplines, I think, you know, philosophers are dubious on of, you know, being heaviest. Uh, I was once at a uh, meeting, I think it was at Princeton or Yale. Anyway, I got into an argument with a classicist, a black woman in classics. And the question was, which one is the whitest of them all? So she was claiming it was classics. I was saying, no, it's philosophy. And we're on the verge of you know, starting to duke it out when, you know, fortunately, you know, the break was over. I said, no, back to the conference, guys. Fight it out afterwards outside. So anyway, so I think philosophy is the whitest of them all. And you know, there's this sort of imagery. If you think of philosophers, you, know, you have Aristotle, you have a bust of Plato. So it's these busts of dead white guys sort of marching through the ages. And the question is, how do philosophical ideas develop? Well, it's clear. It's a sort of transition from this white marble bust to this one, to this one, to this one. So you get a kind of account that never touches ground to reality. 
And I'm going to suggest this is insane. You know, it's not the case that ideas develop like that at all. And we have to ask ourselves, what are the bodies to which these heads are attached? How are these bodies situated in the society? What particular social groups do they belong to? What particular time period are we in? And that will give us a much more illuminating way of understanding the development of ideas. In other words, it's going to be a materialist analysis of how these ideas develop, rather than one that sort of restricts itself to ideas. So once you think of that, you ask yourself the question, now who have the philosophers in the West been? Wait a minute, it's been white guys, sort of in a moment of revelation. So it's not that you know, stuff is just sort of transcendental and it's otherworldly and it's sort of you know, completely removed from vulgar terrestrial influences. It's pretty well been white guys and for the most part, privileged white guys. So you, know, you have um, one or two women historical, you get sort of more in the modern period, obviously, and the West, you know, obviously very few people of color. So ask yourself then the following question. If the main body of philosophers, and body is the appropriate term here, it's been the male body, the white body, the class privileged body, what is liberalism going to be like? It's going to be classist and racist and sexist. This should not be a discovery like in Casablanca. I'm shocked, shocked to discover that <laughs> liberalism is class. What would you expect if you know those are the dominant values of the time, if these are the people putting them forward, it should be the least surprising thing in the world. And if you want evidence, there's this book I've been sort of, you know, plugging ever since I read it, uh, an Italian guy, Liberalism a Counter History. So the idea is, you know, every nasty thing you ever suspected about liberalism turns out to be true, and it's worse. It's even worse than you imagined. It's not merely that it's sexist and racist, but even, I mean, we, in, in this country, as you know, classes don't exist. It's a famous classless society, ha ha. So, you know, there's not that much talk about class. Even the white male working class, if you think of, you know, of what we associate with the modern period, basic stuff like you know, the right to vote, and then ask yourself, when does the white male working class get the vote? And in many cases, sort of late 19th century, early 20th century, etc. So even in the US, it's basically only under Jacksonian democracy. So this is a very exclusionary ideology. And a simple way to put it is that the dominant varieties of liberalism have historically excluded the majority of the world's population. Just sort of think about that and digest it. This is the ideology of inclusion, of universalism, of everybody being equal, and the dominant rights of liberalism have historically excluded the majority of the world's population. So liberalism has basically been illiberalism for all but a minority. And once you take that fact into account, rather than sweeping it under the rug, then what it means is that we need to rethink our histories of liberalism. And you'll be glad it's not going to do one of the sort of heavy philosophical treatises, you know, these huge books that are only good for like, I don't know, doorstops or fending off burglars or squashing cockroaches or if you're facing a firing squad, good to sort of have one of them in your shirt. <laughs> it's going to be very simple and easy. So I've I've sort of made it easy for you in this diagram. You can cut out and paste the place where you do your heavy thinking. I don't know whether on the refrigerator door, if you do it in the kitchen, or in the bathroom, you sort of have it in the, on the john. Anyway, so these diagrams sum it all up. Though again, I must ask you, please do not rush to the exit now that you realize this. So the top diagram is the conventional periodization. It's what we tell our students. And this sort of just so fair story goes like this. Once upon a time, in the bad old days, in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome or in medieval Europe, you had all kinds of social hierarchies. So in ancient Greece and Rome, you had a division between citizens and slaves. In the medieval period, you had lords and serfs. So the dominant political philosophies were inegalitarian and proud of it. Equality was not exactly a central value for the period. And then everything changed. There was the dawn of modernity, you have the American Revolution, you have the French Revolution, so we enter into the age of egalitarian ideology. So it's a sort of simple periodization. Ancient, bad, hierarchy. Medieval, bad, hierarchy. Modernity, good, equality. A fairer story for our children and our students. Now the actual story is the second diagram. And the actual story points out 
that whereas in the pre-modern period you had inegalitarian ideologies of a non-liberal kind, in the modern period you continue to have inegalitarian ideologies, but now of a modern kind. So in the ancient world, and this was not originally part of the story before feminist scholarship came along, you also had, apart from you know, slaves and citizens, you had men over women. So that's a sort of basic form of domination, not usually spoken about in political philosophy texts until comparatively recently, similarly for the medieval period. And this, the weird thing about this male over, woman, male over female um, hierarchy is that it doesn't go away. It's still there in modernity. And in addition, you now have a new form of domination in the form of race. So if you think of things that way, then what you have is a transition from pre-modern inegalitarian ideologies to modern inegalitarian ideology. And what is the name of that modern inegalitarian ideology? Liberalism. So I think you'll agree with me that this is a more illuminating way to think of liberalism once you recognize, as I say, that the majority of the population were excluded from its promise. So what should we do with this fact? Well, here are some suggestions, and I've been trying to do this in my own work, and um, as Chip pointed out, there are far more people now in political theory, there are beginning to be some in political philosophy doing this. You need to rewrite the history of liberalism rather than obscuring these exclusions, we should highlight them. We should also make clear the role of the canonical liberal theory, sort of big names, you know, David Hume, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, their role in all of this. It's not the case that this stuff was being done by some you know, unknown fly-by-night people sort of came that night and sort of scribbled over Locke's text or Kant's text. It's Locke, Kant, Mill, these guys themselves are saying this stuff. And on that basis, we should then rethink liberalism to achieve a genuine liberal justice that would take this history into account. So consider the big three of class, gender, and race. So the left liberal critique, familiar to all of us, pointing out that people historically have not been atomic individuals, but members of different classes, that you know, working class folks have been disadvantaged, and that a liberal theory that's sort of promising to achieve self-realization for everybody needs to curb corporate power, needs to sort of um, expand you know, the rights that working class folk have, et cetera, et cetera. Feminist critique, again, people are not atomic individuals, they're gender divided, women are excluded from individual status, as you should know, women couldn't even vote originally, women couldn't own property, women couldn't run for office. In this country, as you know, it's not until 1920 that women get the vote in some European country, I think in France it might be as late as 1945, et cetera, et cetera. And then similar in the, in the case of race, um, we need to sort of talk about the historical disadvantage of people by race and racial structures and so forth. So here's my claim. Once you sort of disaggregate liberal theory into its various components and sort of look at the particular versions of B, C, D, and E that have developed and then sort of work on how to reconstruct liberalism, take this history into account, then none of these critiques, I would claim, challenge liberalism in principle. So what they challenge are the particular varieties of liberalism that have been most historically dominant, the particular social ontologies associated with them, the particular mappings of the polity associated with them, the particular accounts of history associated with them, and finally, the particular schedules of rights. So once you sort of recognize the contingency of the way liberalism has developed and the shaping of liberalism by privileged, white male power, you then see how the question could be asked, what would a liberalism look like that had not been shaped in those ways? Okay, so this argument goes through for class, it goes through for gender, but my focus here is going to be on race, and my argument is not, of course, that we should ignore those other things, but that historically, when I started doing this stuff, race was under-theorized, under-theorized in political philosophy, under-theorized in political theory. Okay, so the question then is, why is it that the critique on lines of race has not been as well represented in our textbooks as gender critique or the class critique? And so yes, there are two main reasons. So one is that race has been seen by many people as a very recent development in human history. Gender, I would assume, the oldest oppression of them all, going back to the origin of the species. 
Um, there's sort of long-standing debate among feminists. When did patriarchy be begin? But we know that when it did begin, it's a really long time ago. Class society, thousands of years. But many people have thought that race is a product of modernity, by which I mean not that you know, um, race Okay, here's, here's a simple way of thinking it. Let us suppose we were to sort of transport this auditorium back to 1000 AD. So we're somewhere in feudal Europe. Now, it's not the case that everybody turns gray. It's not the case that you know, everybody sort of develops the same kind of facial features and hair textures. But the argument is that people would no longer have a race. Because if you're in a feudal village, the crucial identity is going to be, are you a Christian or not? And which particular lord is it that you swear allegiance to? So race, the argument was, is not going to be a crucial category for such folks. So from this point of view, race is a product of modernity, and racial injustice, likewise, a product of modernity. So you could say, well, the reason that you know, political philosophers and theorists have not talked about race is because, look, this is just the past few hundred years. Gender domination, way back. Class domination, way back. Race, really kind of modern. So first point to make is this narrative has been challenged. This was a narrative that was dominant after World War II. Race, a product of European imperialism and colonialism. Europeans go into the world, they see these different peoples, they classify them racially, that's where race comes from. But increasingly, this narrative is being challenged. And for anybody who's interested, you're going to need lots of time for this big book. Let me recommend, so this is an Israeli classicist, The Invention of Racism in Classical Antiquity. And this is a guy who knows like a zillion languages, so in a, on every page you have to get through like footnotes in 10 different languages. So true confession time, I never made it all the way through. <laughs> I made it two thirds of the way through. I, I think I deserve some kind of medal for that. Anyway, so Isaac's thesis is that the conventional narrative is quite wrong, and that racism goes back to the classical world. And his argument, in fact, is that the pioneering racist theorist of the Western tradition is none other than Aristotle. Because Aristotle said, some people are natural slaves, and the people he associated with this category were the Persians. So once you have a category, a stigmatizing category, that's ethnically linked, Isaac says, that's racism. And there are a bunch of like-minded folks had a conference a few years later, and they came up with another book, and that's one is The Origins of Racism in the West. And since then, there's been more and more work coming out claiming that you did have race in the ancient world, and you also had race in the medieval period. And, um, in the medieval period, obviously, it's not the case that most of the population can read or write, so it's not the case that you get any influence in that, that point of view. But in the idea is that more or less everybody is a Christian, apart from a few sort of minority religious groups. And the Christian church has an iconography, a set of images, and these images are focused in part on what are called the monstrous races. And the monstrous races include things that are clearly sort of utterly fantastic, not human, for example. They're giants, they're people with just one leg, they're you know, hairy men, they're people whose, whose faces are not up here but on their chests. There's a whole sort of range of these entities, but they're also human beings. In a very illuminating book, Saracens, Demons, and Jews, and you know, this book argues, and it's sort of full of great illustrations, that you have these four categories of humans. Um, Saracens, who are of course Muslims, Jews, uh, Mongols, and also Ethiopians, which was a general category for Africans. And this author, um, Deborah Strickland, I think is her name, basically argues that these categories have an influence on, you know, on, on the modern period, so that we enter, mo we enter modernity not on, with a sort of tabula rasa, but we already have these, when I say we, you know, the West already has these categories in place, so that when you have the Western voyages of discovery, people already have in their heads these ways of classifying people. So this would then mean that race and racism go back much further than the conventional narrative has, and as such, you could say, well, you know, we need to take race and racial injustice just as seriously as class and gender, because it also is very old. But let's say that this case falls down. Let's say this case cannot be vindicated. It will still be the case, I suggest, that we need to take racial justice seriously. Because if racial injustice is distinctive to modernity, then 
given how much scholarly work has been done and how modernity differs from pre-modernity in recent years, that alone would make it worthy of study. Also, racial injustice has involved great atrocities. Think of slavery, think of indigenous expropriation, think of genocide, at precisely the time when the promise was that modernity meant all people were being treated as equal. And then finally, of course, if you see the modern world as being shaped by European imperialism and colonialism, if you see racial injustice as central to that, it then follows straightforwardly that racial injustice has affected the fate of the majority of the world's population. So for all those reasons, I'm suggesting racial justice and injustice is an important philosophical topic, even if Isaac's analysis and the people agree with him is not vindicated. So the obvious question then is, where is the stuff on race? And that brings me to the point that my introducers made. The whiteness of philosophy. How white is philosophy? Philosophy is so white that <laughs> if you go to an APA meeting, you need to put on dark glasses, otherwise you'll get snow blindness. <laughs> philosophy is so white that if you have a conference on African-American philosophy, everybody needs to travel in a different plane. Because if there are 10 black philosophers in a plane and that plane goes down, that's 10% of the black population wiped out right then and there. So there's a whole set of things like this which I won't bore you with, but this is a very white profession. So the demographic whiteness, unsurprising, um, not controversial, you can't argue with those figures. The conceptual whiteness, that's a more controversial case. Because what philosophers will tell you is that philosophers are dealing with the human condition as such, People of color are human, so hey, you guys are covered already. What are you bitching about? <laughs> human condition, general categories, people of color are human, therefore you can fit under these categories. So you then have to give an argument, as feminists have done with, with categories that are gendered, and say these categories seem to be abstract, they seem to be all-inclusive, but in reality, they tend to presuppose the European and the Europe in this country, the European-American experience. And the evidence would be that in their scenarios, in their framings, in their thought experiments, how many people have done a thought experiment in philosophy? As um, Chip mentioned, my first degree was in physics, and people asked me, why do you switch from physics? And usually I give a pretentious, convoluted answer. Um, I wanted to understand the workings of the universe, and physics wasn't good enough. <laughs> but the real explanation was that in physics, experiments for me never worked out right. Whereas in philosophy, thought experiments, you can make them come out any way you want. So said, this is a discipline for me, thought experiments. Not these you know, real life things where you know, the, the curve is going up when it should go down, and you know, thought experiments. Philosophy, I've discovered my discipline. So if you think of a sort of standard range of examples and scenarios and thought experiments in a philosophy textbook, how many times is the experience of chattel slavery presupposed? How many times the experience of indigenous expropriation or colonialism or imperialism? So the distinctive experience of people of color in modernity, in fact, the experience that makes them people of color in modernity, if you sort of assume the racism as modern analysis, it's excluded from the textbooks. So the conceptual whiteness is there, even if it's not a sort of straightforward to prove as a demographic whiteness. And this shapes, alas, the views of the heavies of the profession. John Locke, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, John Stuart Mill, George Hegel, they all had racist views that arguably shaped the way their liberal principles applied across the color line. So you think of the sort of crucial concepts associated with their work, Think of self-ownership, that's luck. Civilization, that's in a sense, that's all of them. Autonomy and personhood, that's Kant. Cultural development, well, Mill in particular. Contributions to world history, that's Hegel. They're all seen as influenced by race. Um, so again, this Italian guy, Losordo, check out his book. Or in addition, more recently, John Hobson. So um, we're in post-Marxist times, but who knows, um, perhaps Marx is reviving. How many people have read Imperialism, the High Stage of Capitalism? If you had asked this question uh, 20 years ago at a college campus, well, everybody has asked with all sorts of read it for the revolution. Anyway, for those who haven't, so imperialism, the high stage of capitalism, a famous text by Vladimir Lenin, and he quotes this guy, John Hobson, 
was his book on imperialism. And this guy is his great grandson. So it's sort of you know, continuing the good work. So a very illuminating book, your centric conception of world politics. He surveys a quarter millennium, 250 years of Western political theory. And he shows that where it's not outright racist, it's, you know, uh, it's culturally racist, it's institutionally, sort of you know, Eurocentric and so forth. So it's all very illuminating. So you have this history of liberalism basically being racialized. And you might say, well, okay, let's say I conceded that. That was then, this is now. So why is this past history relevant to the liberalism of today? So you turn the page, and you should now be on page six, guys. And again, with one of my very useful diagrams, I explain. Liberalism, I claim, should be thought of as racial. And there's a sort of crude and overt sense, liberalism as overtly racist, and that's for the most part the liberalism of the past. And I suggest that we're now in a different epoch in which liber liberalism continues to be racialized, but now it's in a more subtle way. It's not manifested in racist statements about people of color. It's manifested in the fact that the whole apparatus is conceptually shaped and ethically oriented by the interests, by the perspective, by the experience of the racial privilege, which is not embarrassing anybody in the room, white people. <laughs> and the failure to deal with racial justice, I'm suggesting, is itself a clear-cut manifestation of this whiteness. So given the case I've made, racial justice should be up front and central. It's not up front and central. What's the explanation? Here's the straightforward explanation. Materialist understanding of how ideas develop, consider you know, whose bodies these heads are attached to, it immediately becomes unmysterious why racial justice is not a central theme of today's liberal political philosophy. And my poster boy is going to be John Rawls. Now, um, apart from the particular hazards of sort of dealing with disgruntled Marxists, irate post-structuralists and post-colonialists. There are also the particular danger of dealing with former students of John Rawls. <laughs> so I, I always have to ask when I come to this section of the paper, are there any such people in the room? Could they please identify themselves so I know whom to stay away from? OK, they obviously decided to keep mom so they can ambush me on the way out. So I'll be watching out for you. OK, so John Rawls. John Rawls is the main American justice guy of the 20th century. In fact, his fans would say he's the most important political philosopher, period, not just American, of the 20th century. So huge influence on, on um, justice theory, but the influence, alas, has been negative as well as positive. So here's the positive part. In the mid-50s in the Anglo-American world, political philosophy was moribund. Politi um, Anglo-American political philosophers tend to say political philosophy was moribund, but we need to recognize that there's a huge world outside of Anglo-American political philosophy. But anyway, if you think that your little world is the world, they're saying political philosophy is on its deathbed. The stuff was so boring that it's not merely that people reading the articles tended to fall asleep, which is pretty well understandable. Even the people writing the articles tended to fall asleep. You know, you're writing, okay. Uh, political obligation is, uh, what, where, what was I saying? So John Rawls performed a kind of Jesus act, sort of the resurrection of Lazarus. He said, arise, arise, political philosophy. And lo and behold, political philosophy rose and said, hey, what's, the, what's going on, Jesus? Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, not Jesus, John. Um, what's going on, John? Okay. So Rawls resurrects Anglo-American political philosophy. Sort of, you know, brings it back to life and sort of what was called grand theory, sort of exciting stuff when you can sort of make sweeping claims and thought experiments. Let's not forget how crucial those are. So John Rawls does all that. Give him credit for that. Now, what's the downside? The downside is that he comes up with a theory of justice which is basically focused on the white male class experience. So he's intervening in a classic debate in European and sort of Western political theory in general, which is, is a just society one in which the free market is sort of left sort of its workings and you know, that will sort of make sure things come okay? Or is he committed to a theory which says the state needs to intervene on behalf of the citizens who are sort of less, um, less advantaged, the state needs to transfer resources to them and so forth. So the traditional left-right split in political theory and Rawls is located on the left and for many people, you know, uh, whatever criticism one might make of the book, you could see it as the best statement 
the best 20th century statement of the social democratic vision. You remember in the election, Denmark, Sweden, okay, so Rawls is like a Denmark guy. So, you know, Denmark in the US, read John Rawls as a theory of justice. So give him credit for that. Uh, not to sort of poo-poo Denmark in the United States. Hey, I think you know, it would be pretty, pretty, pretty good. Anyway, but here's the problem. He's not really intervening in gender issues. He has a famous debate with um, well-known political theorist Susan Muller Oaken. Um, in fact, um, I was at a conference uh, in Oxford and there was a young woman in political theory there. Uh, and she has an essay sort of looking at the rawls Oaken correspondence. So, um, Keep, keep your eye on that to be appearing sometime soon. It shows the extent to which you know, Rawls continued to engage with her over the course of his life. So, not good on gender and almost nothing at all on race. And why is this? How could it be the case that you grew up, Rawls was born around 1920, you grew up in you know, the racist United States, the, the pro United States, you fight in World War II, by the way, um, for younger people who might not know this, the army was segregated until 1948. Truman desegregates the army, but World War II, the war against fascism, was fought in the United States with a segregated army. So Rawls is you know, there in the Pacific in a segregated army. He's right in the 60s when you have all the ghetto uprisings, etc., etc. So you want to say to John, now make sure racial justice is dealt with in this book. And the problem is that Rawls decides that the best way to do social justice theory is to focus on justice for a perfectly just society. You might say, what's wrong with that? Perfectly just society, isn't that what we're all aiming for? We may not get there, but it's like a sort of aspirational thing, like the arc of the moral universe bends toward John Rawls. That sounds a bit, okay. <laughs> Snarky comment, which I will take, take back. So, okay, so perfectly just society. Here's the problem. He basically argued that to do Corrective justice, you start off with perfect justice, and then on that basis, you then move to these other areas. And he never made the transition himself over his lifetime. At the end of his life, those of us, minority of us in the profession, addressing these issues, were still waiting for Rawls to do the stuff. And in addition, you could say, well, Rawls can't do everything. His disciples, you know, his numerous you know, disciples and exegetes, they did not take this task on either. So I now have a set of snarky comments on Rawls. So if you'll forgive me, um, what can I say? The whiteness of Rawls and Rawlsianism. And as I say, part of the point of this is sort of make a case for how you can have a discipline that's not merely demographically white, but conceptually white, even though it's dealing with abstractions, it's dealing with the human condition. You say these abstractions include everybody. I'm trying to show you how they do not include everybody. So prioritizing of ideal theory which automatically excludes racial justice. Explicit concession is last book. His last book is Justice as Fairness. Oh, by the way, um, these, these principles, they don't apply to racist societies. What? <laughs> John, say it isn't so. I've been waiting all these decades and there's a sort of offhand remark, oh, by the way, these principles don't apply to racist societies. So for me, this should have been in bold, it should be like a sort of 24-point font, <laughs> by the way, and in fact, why didn't you say that in a theory of justice way back when? So a, now he tells us. Failure to recognize race as a transnational structure. Failure to mention the Atlantic slave trade in his work. Failure to mention Native Americans, so think of it. Five books, 2,000 pages, Native Americans never appear in the five books of John Rawls. Failure to condemn, failure to even mention European imperialism and colonialism. Explanatory nationalism. So this phrase was coined by one of his students, Thomas Pogan. What does that mean? Well, you look around the world and you see that some nations are rich and some nations are poor. Obviously a very important question. You, you say, well, what's the explanation for this? Rawls' explanation is it has to do with national cultures and traditions. What does that mean? Well, let's take the country where I'm from, Jamaica. Why, why are Jamaicans poor? It's because they spend all their time hanging out on the beach smoking ganja. 
Now, if it were the case, uh, okay, that's um, dope for you non-Jamaicans. Non they're uh, smoking dope all the time. So obviously, you know, they're not doing sort of hard work necessary to sort of be a vibrant and sort of upstanding nation. It doesn't have anything to do with slavery. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that Jamaica was a British colony for more than 300 years. It doesn't have to do anything to do with sort of, you know, national, sort of global terms of trade and how they disadvantage nature in the former third world. It's national cultures and traditions. So if you think of the culture of poverty in the US and the kind of um, role that that kind of argument has played in terms of you know, why are people in the ghetto poor, it's a culture of poverty on a global scale. So this is not a good position for a theorist of justice to be taking. But finally, here is one of the most startling things of all. The most, arguably, the most important measure of corrective racial justice in the United States in the post-war period is affirmative action. The phrase affirmative action makes no appearance in the 2,000 pages of the five books of John Rawls. And as I said, it's not just Rawls, it's his disciples. There have sort of been numerous handbooks and guides to Rawls in the past 10 years. And, and the biggest one, um, two editors, John Mandel and David Reedy, uh, as a companion or guidebook, I can't recall, nearly 600 pages. If you look up affirmative action in the index, you get reference to a single endnote sentence. So these are not folks concerned about racial justice, despite the fact that they're citizens for the most part of a country to whom, to which racial injustice has been central from its founding. Okay, so that's the radical part. Here now is the part that pisses off my lefty friends. Having said all that snarky stuff, I'm now going to try to outline an argument to reclaim Rawlsianism for racial justice. So since we're running out of time, I want to give you guys time to ask lots of questions. Let's skip ahead to page eight. So those two diagrams basically summarize the Rawlsian way of looking at things when you're trying to come up with principles of justice for an ideally just society. You imagine yourself behind a veil of ignorance, and the veil of ignorance blocks from you knowledge of the society you're going to enter into and blocks from you knowledge of crucial factors of your own identity. So you're choosing principles of justice not on moral grounds, but on prudential grounds, on self-interested grounds. You think, well, how could that work? Because people just choose principles that are biased towards a group. So you, know, you could have men choosing a patriarchal society, um, racists choosing a racist society, etc., etc. The veil of ignorance is Rawls's brilliant idea for preventing this kind of decision making. You don't know behind the veil of ignorance whether you're going to sort of male or female, white or black, straight or gray, abled or disabled, etc., etc. So you're then going to sort of choose a society out of self interest, which is going to be fair to everybody. Otherwise, when the veil of ignorance lifts, you could turn out to be a member of one of the groups that's disadvantaged. I stuck in race there. Race, well, it's not originally have race there, but I sort of stuck in race there. So here's the problem with this. This will give us a society of non-discrimination, but it won't give us the more controversial measures of racial justice that have been suggested recently as like affirmative action or reparations, which sort of pops up periodically in US history after the Civil War, Fort Acres and a Mule, 2000, Randall Robinson's book, The Debt, more recently, Ta-Nehisi Coates' article in The Atlantic, the case for, you know, case, 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 case for some kind of reparations. Okay, so here's how I suggest modifying the thought experiment, because remember, as I said, I fled from physics because my real life experiments didn't work out. So now I'm in philosophy, thought, thank God. So here's my thought experiment. Imagine yourself behind a veil of ignorance, but you're not choosing principles for an ideal society. That's not on the table. You're choosing principles for a society that's historically a white supremacist society. And the question you're asking yourself is, when the veil lifts, suppose I'm a black woman in the ghetto on Southside Chicago. Suppose I'm a Latina somewhere in the Southwestern United States. Suppose I'm a Native American on the reservation. In technical philosophical language, you're screwed. <laughs> so the question you need to ask yourself is, 
what measures of corrective justice do I want to see put in place by the state to make sure that I'm as unscrewed as possible? What kind of public policy, what kind of anti-discrimination measures, what kind of social and economic and legal restructuring would I want to see the state put in place? And my suggestion is that we sort of think of things that way and we're sort of speeding up. Um, so onto page nine now, guys. So you'll come up, I suggest, with the following three principles of corrective racial justice. End racially unequal citizenship, and by what that I mean that people of color have traditionally been seen in this country either as non-citizens or second class um, people. So we want to end citizenship that's racially unequal. End racial exploitation. I mean by that that whites have historically had advantages, not merely in terms of you know, situation of slavery, or, you know, uh, versus the case of Native Americans being expropriated, but even in the more modern period under a regime of segregation, where as a black person or a person of color more generally, you don't have an equal chance of getting a job, and whites have benefited from this. And a very important book that um, any sociologist in the room would know, published in the mid-90s, Melvin Alvin, Thomas Shapiro, Black Wealth, White Wealth, seen as one of the most important books on race of the past 30 years. And their innovation was a recognition that the prognosis for racial equality in a society, wealth is a far more important indicator than income. And whereas the wealth differences between median white and median black households, when the region of, say, a median black household, say 50% of the income of a median white household, in the case of wealth, the differences are far greater. It fluctuates with the economy, but a few years ago, the median white household had 20 times the wealth of the median black household and 17 times the wealth of the median Latino household. So huge difference. So I suggest that this difference is a manifestation of racial exploitation and that we sort of need to end that, meaning not merely sort of dismantling the structures that sort of keep it alive, but also redistribution of what would count in the liberal framework as unjust enrichment. So liberalism, I'm claiming, has the apparatus to deal with this. It's just that it has not been developed as it should, sort of take this non-ideal history into account. And finally, racial And again, a brief plug for philosophy, the ontological. So the ontological stigmatization of people as lesser beings because of racial membership. And if you think of you know, the videos I'm sure you've all seen, um, okay, so sleeping while black, driving while black, being in Dennis while black. Um, there's a long list, basically, you know, breathing while black, you know. And you know, people, you, cops have been called on. You, you, I mean, you, you're lucky if you escape being shot. And you know, this is sort of a manifestation of the fact that blacks are not seen as equal citizens in the country. So there's a kind of fundamental ontological disrespect arising out of the fact that the country was founded on slavery and that legacy psychologically, morally, ontologically has perpetuated itself all these hundreds of years later. So my claim is that you come up with these three principles and you can then address these different manifestations of racial injustice and you have these nice and snappy in bold PCJ 1, 2, and 3 and that will end racial injustice. So you see, within a liberal framework, I have shown how racial injustice can be ended. Thank you.